about half of the patients that I see have tinnitus or ringing in the ears. And there's lots of different kinds of tinnitus. Some of it's high pitched, some of it's low pitched, some of it's pulsatile, some of it is like a hum. Hmm. And then the intensity comes and goes. So I'm just gonna go through some of the neurology of tinnitus. As you can see from he here, there's lots of different ways that cervical instability causes tinnitus. So I, I just wanna give a, an overview. The most common way that cervical instability causes ringing in the ears is because it screws up eustachian tube function. And then we're gonna talk more about that soon. If it causes compression of the carotid sheath or carotid artery compression, then you normally get a pulsatile tinnitus. Like you, it almost varies with the heart rate. When a person has compression of the internal jugular vein, then the internal jugular vein narrows, then the velocity in the uh, internal jugular vein can go up from say uh, 30 to like a 90, you know, and then, so it's like a riptide, you know, like through, through the internal jugular vein and often that they call it hum tinnitus, hum tinnitus. So it's like, you know, you can almost hear it like continuously where the carotid artery pulsates. When cervical instability causes a blockage of cerebral spinal fluid, that cerebral spinal fluid goes on to all the cranial nerves, including the nerve that has to do with hearing, you know, which is the vestibular cochlear nerve. And that can cause compression or injury to the nerve, which again can relate to tinnitus. Then when cervical instability causes a breakdown of the cervical curve, which we call cervical destructure, it can stretch the vagus nerve. When the vagus nerve signals get blocked, the levator veli palatini muscle doesn't work right, so the palate doesn't elevate normally on the side of the vagus nerve stretching or compression. That can cause the eustachian tube not to open or close normally on that side, and you get eustachian tube dysfunction, and you get the ringing of the ears. Many people get diagnosed with Meniere's disease and sometimes the aptly maneuvers like they, you, you know, you rotate the head and the crystals, if there is crystals in the inner ear, uh, those can get dislodged and those aptly maneuvers can be curative. When they're not curative and the tinnitus continues despite medications, physical therapy, chiropractic care, then you have to think of the person has a ligament problem, so you have to go to a ligament doctor, you know, like, like a ligamentologist that I call, and I've been studying ligaments for the last 30 years, and then get treatment for the ligament problem, which is prolotherapy, which is an injection technique that causes the strengthening and tightening of ligaments. So this is a model of the ear. You have the ear sound waves go into the ear. It causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate that vibration causes motion in the bones. The bones then go to the hearing nerve, which is the cranial nerve eight, the vestibular cochlear nerve. And then those signals then go to the brain, then you hear. The purpose of the eustachian tube is to regulate or normalize the pressures of the inner ear to atmospheric pressure. So if your eustachian tube isn't opening or closing normally on one side, it means that the pressure on this side of the ear, inner ear and this side of the inner ear is gonna be different. So any of us who have been on airplanes and we're going up and down airplanes, if you pay attention, you'll see that there's a moment in time where you'll have a ringing in your ear because the eustachian tubes, because they're not gonna be totally coordinated between the two ears when there's such a drastic pressure change in atmospheric pressure when you're going up and down in an airplane. So you'll see that you'll have ringing in the ear. Or if somebody has a cold, like you have a cold, then there's the tonsils are swollen, so the tonsils are swollen, so that can block the eustachian tube in your throat. So then you can get 
ringing in the ears or a sound in your inner ear. Now, so the ear, all the cells of the body make fluid that the body has to get rid of. So the way that the, the ear gets rid of fluid is by opening of the eustachian tube. So when the eustachian tube, the fluid goes into your throat and then, then into your digestive tract out of your body. When the eustachian tube doesn't open or close normally, the fluid accumulates. So if you have ringing of the ear and you kind of notice that the ear is more full on that side than the other side, then I'm telling you, you have cervical instability that's affecting the muscles aren't working correctly that open your eustachian tube. There's several muscles that are involved in opening of the eustachian tube. I'm gonna highlight two of them. One is innervated by the vagus nerve. That's the levator villi palatini muscle. And you could tell whether you're, that muscle's working or not. So go into a mirror, say ah, and then see if your palate elevates equally on both sides. So on the ear, uh, in the ear where it's full or you have more ringing of the ear, you might notice that the palate doesn't elevate as much on that side. So in other words, the uvula may deviate. So if this one's not working, like let's just say the right uh, levator villi palatini muscle's not working and this one's working, it's gonna pull the uvula to the opposite side. And then the palate, when you say, ah, it's gonna elevate more on this side. So that's a sign that you have weakness of the levator villi palatini muscle, which is innervated by the vagus nerve. The ganglion of the vagus nerve sits by C1. So when we find that, we normally find that the person has upper cervical instability. The second muscle is the tensor Vli palatini muscle that's innervated by cranial nerve 5. Now you might say, well how does cervical instability affect cranial nerve 5? This is the spinal cord, this is cervical nerve root 1, cervical nerve root 2, cervical nerve root 3. So the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5, the uh, cell bodies, you know, the DNA of that um, nerve, it's in the brain stem, so this is the brain stem, this is the spinal cord, the foramen magnum's around right here, so the skull's here, your neck's here, this is all your neck, then the cell bodies, the ganglion, the nucleus of the trigeminal nerve in the spinal cord, this is really important, can go all the way down to C3. So that means that you could have upper cervical instability, then it affects the trigeminal nucleus. So you could literally have trigeminal neuralgia or a problem in the nerve input of the trigeminal nerve to various muscles by an upper cervical problem. So there's two ways that upper cervical injury, upper cervical instability can cause eustachian tube dysfunction and then it could cause terrible tinnitus. Okay, I got out Morgan. You guys all know Morgan for this uh, illustration. You could have cervical instability causing narrowing of the carotid arteries. The carotid artery goes right in front of the cervical vertebrae. So in other words, if you have cervical ligament injury, it can compress the uh, carotid artery. If it, caress, if it compresses the carotid artery, it's like a riptide. The velocities go really, really fast in the carotid arteries. Well, the carotid artery, it goes right by your ear, right? It goes right by your ear. Then you, the tinnitus in that sense is pulsatile. You know, whoosh, 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 whoosh. you know, it's like a, a pitching sound that varies with the heartbeat. When cervical instability causes vagus nerve impairment, which we talked about, you're gonna get ear fullness. You could have e even decreased hearing. So if you have t ringing of the ear and you have these other symptoms, and that's a sign that it's a vagus nerve problem. When you get internal jugular compression, you get a humming ringing. So if the ringing is more steady and it's more of a humming sensation, then you gotta think that it's from internal jugular vein compression. The way we diagnose these things is by ultrasound of the neck, high resolution ultrasound. So we can look at the velocities of the carotid artery, 
the jugular vein and we can put a person in various maneuvers and see if the velocities change and for treatment purposes if something's like say the atlas is rotated and it's hitting the carotid artery or the C2 is rotated hitting the carotid artery or the jugular vein then we can adjust them and see if the ringing of the ears improves right away and then we can objectively measure the velocities to see if the velocities are improved. If it's just a terrible neck curve, you know, just a terrible neck curve, like instead of being lordotic, it's kyphotic, then of course we can put weights on the person, then measure the velocities or just ask the person if the ringing of the ears is better and then you know right away whether that's the cause of it.